we may be saved and spend eternity with you. Today we come before you again to worship you and to praise you. We pray, Lord, that our worship of your holy name is pleasing to you. Amen. Now, we haven't got any musicians today. We've given them the, the day off. I think they've deserved it. So we're going to just have some um, video, sing along to videos. And I'm going to have a nice relaxed service, so please remain seated while we sing. Uh, we're having two new songs that you don't know and one that you do. So please remain seated. And our first one is uh, a new, the new Phil Wickham song called House of the Lord. So please stay, stay seated and sing along if you'd like to. If you don't know it, just listen to the beautiful words. Please sing along, it's King of Kings. Song is one also that you don't know, and it's I Speak Jesus, which is Darlene Zeck. You know, remember her from Shout to the Lord, she wrote that song. This is another lovely song, so sit back and, and listen. And we will be singing it later on in church another time. So, <laughs> we're now going to have Andrew bring the announcements. Thanks, Cathy. Um, that is a, a beautiful, well, both those songs, those new songs, really, really great and powerful and beautiful. Right, so welcome to our service this morning. I know we're a bit thin in numbers, but I know the Lord is here with us, and I trust that your Christmas has been wonderful so far. And this is all a, a part of Christmas. And for us to be celebrating uh, together on the first day of the week so close to Christmas is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it is good for us to be here and I welcome you. Uh, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. In fact, in our um, family for many, many years, we've had this little tradition where the first thing that we say to each other in the morning is, um, fear not, for behold, I bring you uh, glad tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And uh, that message went out. Um, Debbie started it off this mo uh, yesterday morning with a little text to our little family group. And the kids responded. Each one responded with a little bit. So that was really, really wonderful. And it is good to uh, rejoice and to tell the news of Jesus come to be our saviour. We took up uh, the COCO, which is Church of Christ Overseas Aid um, donations, instead of our regular offering yesterday. And uh, of the money that was raised from that just for yesterday uh, was $280. Now there, uh, I believe, have been some other envelopes that have come in earlier because we've had that opportunity out there for a number of weeks for people to give. So those will be added to that and we'll send those off um, for the Stronger Together Christmas uh, appeal this year. So thank you for your generosity in that and uh, let's pray for those who are doing it a lot tougher than we have here and we take for granted sometimes just how blessed we are in this nation. Uh, Christmas greetings from Surrey. Um, so there is our Bowen family uh, we're wishing their church family here at Asquith a uh, merry and a happy and a blessed Christmas. Um, also, Christmas blessings and greetings from Gwen. Uh, I was talking to her just a, a Christmas Eve and so just gave her a call to see how she's doing. She had an eye operation last week just this Monday past. It's still early days to know how well that's gone. Uh, she did get to see her, her surgeon um, on the Wednesday after the op, and he just said, it's a waiting game now. Let's wait, let's see how the eye um, recovers. So just pray for her. She was a, a very much disappointed because this is the first Christmas that she couldn't be in church. Anywhere. They weren't having services at the nursing home and um, she obviously wasn't able to come and be with us or go anywhere else to church. 
and uh, I think she's not even able to be with um, family today. So pray for Gwen. Remember her in your prayers. And she's certainly remembering us and the church with great fondness. And so she sends her love and greetings. Stamps. At this time of year, you've probably gotten a few more cards than normal uh, or other correspondence. Don't forget to peel off, uh, rip off the stamps on the corner of your envelope and uh, bring them to church. Pop them in the box. Uh, Yvonne Love gets them sent off for auction and they get turned into wheelchairs. So how about that? That's recycling paper into wheelchairs. I've never heard of that before. Debbie. Yeah, cut. I did say peel. Yeah. Tear, tear off the corner of, or cut off the corner of the envelope. Thanks, Debbie. Yep. So, um, yeah, so collect your stamps. Often they get thrown away, but don't. Let's, let's recycle them for good cause. Holiday Sunday for kids, yes, and I was beginning to wonder if there would be any Holiday Sunday for kids, but we have a good little contingent, and they're keen as mustard, so thank you guys, off you go. And talking about holidays, uh, happy holidays everyone, may you have a blessed, um, blessed time, and we've got New Year's Eve coming up. And uh, let's just all pray that there is um, a lot of, I don't know, good common sense that prevails over New Year's uh, Day and the time of uh, activity. A lot of people seem to get a bit overly excited at New Year's Eve. There's also a good chance for more of the COVID spreading, etc. So let's pray that that doesn't happen so much. But I do understand that we're going to be locked down a little bit harder now that Christmas is um, is behind us and uh, the government's going to, I think, um, cause a lot more restrictions to try and rein in the, the rapid spread of this uh, latest variant. But talking about holidays, Gil and, and Jade, Gil um, being here on staff, is taking some holidays over the next few weeks and uh, for good reason. Um, not only because he needs a break, but because little baby core is due any day now. So I think the due date is tomorrow. So let's be praying for Jade. Let's pray for a good, safe and happy delivery and that all goes well um, for the cause. Debbie and I will be going to South Australia if the borders are open, if they'll let us fly in, uh, on the 11th of January. So. Uh, after Gil and Jade have had a little bit of a break, um, Debbie and I will be taking a little bit of a break and go and see family over there. So that's just letting you know uh, what the staff here are doing over these next few weeks of holidays, but may you have a blessed and wonderful holiday period. Okay. We're now going to prepare for the most important part of our service today with communion. this one so you can sing along or you can just listen if you like. Philip's now going to, now going to bring us communion. Mm -hmm. um, 
So about two weeks ago, I spoke about the importance of keeping Christ in Christmas. And in reality, though, Christ has never left Christmas. It's people themselves who have stepped away from Jesus' presence at Christmas. And today, of course, is Boxing Day. It's the day after Christmas. And so many people will say that Christmas is over for another year. They step away from Christmas and begin to focus on the next round of holidays and the New Year festivities. But of course, the joy of Christmas is not really over. And I remember re reading recently where someone said that the deepest joy of Christmas comes not from what we do ourselves, but from Jesus' gift of himself through his word and his spirit. And Jesus' gift of himself is what we remember at communion. Communion is just part of a gospel story beginning with Jesus' birth. Without Jesus' birth, we don't have Jesus' ministry on earth. Without that ministry, there are no gospels and there's no crucifixion and resurrection. And without Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, there is no salvation. So the celebration of communion is a prime example of Christmas being with us still. And using a footballing analogy, the referees indicated the end of normal time and we're now playing in time added on, except we don't know how much time added on there is. It's like the analogy being that the end of normal time are the events of that first Christmas, that, oh, sorry, that first Easter with the Last Supper, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And the ongoing celebration of communion is the analogy of us playing in time added on, except we now also have the presence of the Holy Spirit while we wait for Jesus' return. So let's celebrate communion using the emblems Jesus gave to us. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus has asked us to carry on this celebration until he returns. And we'll, we'll distribute the bread and cup together. And if you can take the bread in your own time, but we will drink together at the same time with the cup. And while Christine did distributing the emblems, I'll pray. Lord, we thank you for this time of communion. We thank you that through this simple celebration where we partake of the emblems which you left for us to remember what was done for us on that cross on Calvary by your sacrifice, Lord. And we thank you for this and we thank you that by having faith in you and knowing that what you have done for us is our gateway to heaven, that we too can share that wonderful presence with God that we otherwise would have lost. And we just praise you and thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. Amen.
And now, let us drink together in memory of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And now we'll come together for our church prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you that we can come together here this morning and worship you openly and freely and praise your name. We, we thank you for the presence of everyone here this morning, that they've come to listen to your word, to sing praises to you and just to worship you out of the depths of their heart, Lord. And we thank you for this Christmas season which we're still working through. We thank you for our Christmas Eve service and the opportunity they gave us to present ourselves in an open and public fashion to the people in, in this area, Lord. And we thank you for our Christmas morning service to Lord, where again we gave praises to you and, and thank you for the birth of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we remember those people who can't be with us today, as Andrew's already mentioned, we think in particular of Gwen, who's in, in hospital with the eye operation, Lord, and we just pray that that will be a successful operation and her eyesight can be restored. And we thank you for the fact that over many years we've known Gwen and just welcomed her presence with us, Lord. And we also think too of all those people who are currently away. They've either in the midst of their travels or they have arrived safely to spend Christmas with their family and friends, Lord, and we just pray that you can bring them back to us safely, Lord. And we think too of those people who have lost their lives over the last couple of days through accidents, Lord, and it's a dreadful time at any time of the year to lose somebody through either or through whatever cause that the accident brought on, Lord. But we just pray for those families who have lost loved ones recently and it's an extra time of suffering and pain at Christmas when they realise that those close members of their family or their friends are no longer with us, Lord. So we pray for those people and just pray that you will bring comfort to their hearts, Lord, and they know that they can depend upon you and your strength to guide them through. And we also pray for Grant this morning as he comes to bring us the message, Lord, and we just pray that the words that he speaks will be your words and that what we hear will be what you want us to hear. So we thank you for, thank you for this time but when Grant will bring the message to us this morning. And again, we just praise you and thank you that we are here this morning on a beautiful day that God has given us so that we can celebrate you or, or celebrate your presence with us and that we can worship you. And I just pray that the words we sing and, and the message that is within our hearts will be acceptable to you. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to, going to take up the offering. Just while Christine goes around with the offering, um, the message today is being brought to you uh, by our son-in-law, uh, Grant Mitchell. Um, Grant is married to our daughter, Carolyn, 
Uh, those of you who don't know him, no, no Grant or Carolyn, say hi at the end of the service. I'm sure they'd love to meet you. Um, Grant is um, a teacher at Pacific Hills Christian School. He's the head teacher of middle school for religion. He also teaches and is a, a marker uh, for the ele year 11 and 12 studies of religion. So he's got pretty good credentials. <laughs> Okay, so, um, but Grant's passion uh, is to teach young people about the saving grace and the, uh, of Jesus Christ. So, Grant, the floor is yours. We'll just have our Bible reading first. <laughs> it's taken from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 4 to 11. But you, brothers, and sorry, I'll read from the one up there so that you can all follow. But you, brothers and sisters, are... Uh, no, I'll read from this one because I can see it better. <laughs> But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Well, it's good to be here again with you today as we enter into the Word of God. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you speak through your word, through your spirit. Give us ears, give us hearts to understand and to know what you want to share with us today. And give us the means to put it into practice that we might bring glory to you in all that we do and all that we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you may not realise, and I really appreciate Kathy's introduction, I had a life before I knew the Smiths. A very different life. Um, and in fact, I used to be an engineer before I became a Christian school teacher. And in that other life, I was actually engaged to be married to another lady. Now, Carolyn knows all about this. It's not a surprise for her, okay? Um, and unfortunately, that did not continue into a marriage. The engagement ended. Now, that was quite a few years ago, 1995 to be exact. And as with the end of many important and valuable relationships, I was devastated. I was a broken man. And I remember some of my friends, you know, trying to, you know, speak words of, you know, come on, you'll be right, you know, just get out there and things will be better. I'm like, no, I, just, I don't, I don't want to, I just don't want to know anything about any relationship, you know, I just want to do my work and come home and then do my work and then come home, you know. And I, I kept going along to church on Sundays. But I also had a, a group of friends. We would regularly go out on Thursday nights for dinner at the local leagues club. And for a few weeks, I just didn't feel like going out with them. And then one Monday afternoon, I got a call from one of those friends. He said, this Thursday, we're going out. No, I don't want to go out. I don't want to go out. No, no, no. We're going to come pick you up, he said. All right, all right, yeah. If you're going to come pick me up, that way I don't have to drive. 
And sure enough, he turned up. He said, okay, Grant, it's time to go. I'm like, okay. So he walked out the front, and his car wasn't there. I said, where's your car? He said, oh, we're just a bit down the street. And I'm like, we're just a bit down the street? He goes, yeah. And suddenly he pulls out the CB radio, and he goes, we have the package. And I'm like, what is going on? I'll get back to that story and fill you in on what happened with my friends. Now, a far more recent story of my life. It was only a few years ago. I was experiencing a lot of pressure to succeed in my personal life and my professional life. And I actually wasn't dealing very well with the pressure. And the way I was managing those troubles was, first of all, if there was a particular situation where I had to do something, I gave the least effort to it. I'm not happy to say that, but that, that was one of the ways I managed it. And even worse, sometimes some situations I go, well, I don't need to do anything about that. I can just ignore that and somebody else will deal with it. And, and that's the way I was operating for at, at least many months in my professional life and also my personal life as a husband, as a father, as a friend. However, I felt an underlying impression in my own spirit that I wasn't truly being myself. You know, this way of dealing with the stresses, the difficulties of my life wasn't truly me. And I was actually avoiding the potential I could be and I could grow into because life just seemed too difficult at that time. And then one night, while I was asleep, I had a very vivid dream. In this vivid dream, I was in this beautiful ballroom. To me, my, my mind kind of connected it with this beautiful room that I had seen in a local RSL where you'd have a, a function and people would come maybe for a wedding reception. Just beautiful, you know, all set up. However, in one corner of that room, it didn't seem right. Normally, you know, your ballrooms have these lovely rectangular shapes. But this, this corner had this bulge of walls that were wrong. It, you know, it was coming, instead of being a perfect right angle, it kind of came out and then it, it went back. And I'm thinking, why is that taking away from the beauty of the room? Why am I focusing on that? And suddenly in my dream, um, my, my vision had changed and I was inside that little bulge. And inside that bulge, I sensed something. I'm going to come back to that story too. Because in both of these situations that I've shared with you, I needed encouragement to do something about what was going on in my life. I needed encouragement in that situation where the broken and ended relationship, and I needed encouragement with the way I was operating in my personal and professional life. But what does encouragement really mean? And that's what came up as that last verse of today. If you've got that Bible that was beautifully handed out as you came in, have that open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And verse 11 is our key verse. Therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Now whenever I read from the Bible. I want to know what's the person who wrote this really trying to say? And Paul wrote this. What's he really trying to get at? And if I want to understand how to encourage, I need to know what did he mean by it? So that means when this was written down, it wasn't written down in English, it was written down in Greek. So what's the Greek word? The Greek word that Paul uses here is parakalite. Parakalite. It also comes up in the previous chapter. And it's also used by the Hebrews, uh, the writer of the Hebrews. Now, scholars amongst you might recognise parakalite. It's related to the word parakletos, which is the word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the advocate. So what does parakalite mean? When we're reading Paul say, encourage one another, what is he really trying to say? Well, its literal meaning is to call somebody to your side, to address, to speak to them, which may be done in a way of exhortation, entreaty, comfort, instruction. It may be to console, 
It may be to instruct or to teach. So it's more than just words. There's this coming beside to call someone to be beside you in that action of then speaking. I remember in my very young life, not much younger than my son Cameron is now, the end of year seven, the report came home. How did I go on all my subjects? Maths, fantastic. You know. Geography, okay. English, 120 place out of 120 students. I came last at English. I was, I was just so discouraged. And I remember very distinctly, my dad looked at that, and I'm expecting you know, this rant of like, why aren't you doing better? Come on. You know. And he just looked at me, looked at the report, looked at me, and he said, well, at least next year you can't do any worse. <laughs> and, and some may interpret that as a disappointment, but to me that was actually an encouragement. He understood that was my struggle. And he knew you've hit bottom and the only way is up. So he was beside me and he was comforting and instructing me all in those simple words. But real encouragement is actually more than just words and well-timed words, in fact, like it was from my father. So let's do a little bit of investigating about why was Paul writing this? Encourage one another, just as in fact you are doing. So, if you've got your Bible, as I said, open up to chapter 5. The reading started today at verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Paul's been writing just a little bit earlier about this day. And this day, is actually, in fact, is talking about is the day of the Lord. Now, not Christmas, the first arrival of Jesus, but the day of judgment, the second time Jesus will arrive on earth. And this is a great season to remember that future hope that we have, the second arrival of Jesus, the day of the Lord. And so Paul says, you are not in darkness, so it shouldn't surprise you. Because some members of the Thessalonian church had given up on living in this world. They're like, oh, you know, oh, Jesus is going to return soon, so I don't need to work. I can just sit at home, and he's coming back in a few days. They'd given up on living life in the world. And that was frustrating and disappointing for Paul as their previous pastor and the man who helped establish their church. But even worse, people in the society and was infecting some people in the church were saying, this day's never going to come. It doesn't exist. It's not real. In fact, they were saying peace and safety <laughs> and never expected judgment to occur. They were living in a false security that life would just go on and never have consequence. And so Paul says he doesn't want them to be ignorant, to be surprised. He uses the analogy like a thief coming in the night time. He doesn't want them to be unprepared. He used that in verse 2 of this chapter as well, and then he uses it in our part of the reading. And this image is not a surprise. Jesus used the same image. Peter uses the same image in his second letter. And John uses the same image when he has the revelation. He doesn't want them to be surprised. And he uses another analogy, just in case you weren't getting it. And back in verse 3, he uses the idea of labour pains of a pregnant woman. All right? In a standard society, you're, just, you're not sure when they're going to arrive. So they're surprising. He says, I don't want you to be surprised about this day that's going to come. And he says, you're not in darkness. And here in verse 4, verse 5, verse 7, he's got this comparison of being in day and light versus darkness and night. And here, it's about those who are in the light in the day, they know Jesus, they know that they're saved. And those who are in darkness don't know Jesus and don't know this saving grace. And that's why he says, you are sons and daughters, you are children of the light. You are children of the day. And so be 
self-controlled. Now, in the new translations of the NIV, it uses the word sober. It's not here about alcohol. It's the same idea, sober and self-controlled. Somebody who's able to control what they're deciding to do. And so Paul is trying to say, be prepared. This second day, this second arrival of Jesus is going to come and it should not surprise you because you have the saving grace of Jesus. And there's a great purpose then. In verse 10, he died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. So here Paul connects the second arrival of Jesus in the future with their present reality that Jesus died for them and we will live together with him. And it also makes suggestions that we already know Jesus is present with us right here and right now by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. That's the verse 11. That's why Paul wanted them to build each other up and use encouragement, knowing that they have this future hope and never to give up on that hope and to affect their present, to not kind of go, well, that's it, I won't bother working, I'll just wait for Jesus to return, or even worse, Jesus is never going to return. It's not true encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So what does true encouragement look like? True encouragement occurs when you come beside someone in their need. When they are in need and you provide words that build them up. And that building up words, they could be exhorting, keep going, you're doing great. They could be comforting, I'm sorry for what's happened. It's sad. It could be rebuking. You're doing the wrong thing. And that's not good. It could be instructing. Here's what I think might be good for you to do. Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, gives some clear ways on what does it sound like to be an exhorter, a comforter, a rebuker, an instructor. In chapter 4, verse 29, Paul says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In a sense also, like the song we had earlier, you speak Jesus. You use words like Jesus would. You speak Jesus. When you come alongside someone in their need and you use words that build them up, you speak Jesus. So that story I started earlier with the ballroom and that corner and suddenly in my dream I zoomed, I was inside that unusual What I saw inside there wasn't anything stupendous or amazing. What I realised was, this room is hiding me. I'm hiding in this room from the glorious ballroom. I don't want to engage. And for me, that was a prompt to go, God was just whispering to me saying, why are you hiding? It's obvious to some, that bulge in the beautiful life the ballroom of your life, care in the community of your family. You need others to be encouraged and to be an encourager. When we start with the motive of love and we speak or act as if the other is valuable, then it's encouraging. Why is the other valuable? Remember, God made the other person. God made them in his image and Christ died to redeem them from death. When we see the other as valuable and we have the wisdom to discern their needs, we're going to be encouragers. So remember the story I started my message with. The boys who came to pick me up. I walked outside and the last thing I said, we have the package. We walked a few 
metres down the street. They parked the car further down just to surprise me. And one of my other friends had brought his classic car, this old Hummer. And it was a beautiful, big car. And we all jumped in. Now, when I say we all jumped in, I jumped in with my, my close friend and there was already six guys in the car. This car was big. It could sit a lot of people. And for the rest of the night, we went and had pizza. We went to a golf driving range. We went to putt-putt golf. And we just hung out and we laughed together and we cried together. You see, they called me to their side. They took me and they spoke words that instructed me, that comforted me, that sympathised with me because they discerned what needs I had and their loving motivation meant that night was what I needed. So how about us? Right here, right now, today. How is this going to change your life? Well, first of all, the first challenge I've got for us is do we need to work on making sure our motivation is loving? And it's not self-seeking. When you see somebody who has a need, who's hurting, or when you see somebody do something really well, is your motivation to go up and use words to build them up? Is your motivation to go up and not to kind of put them down so you're a little bit higher? You know, that kind of that false compliment. You know, oh, great word today, Grant, but maybe you could have done this better. You know, the false compliment, maybe? You could do that to me later if you want, that's fine. <laughs> is it about having the motivation for what that person is, their value? Do you need to work on changing your motivation to be more loving? Second, do you need to grow in wisdom so you can discern the needs of others? Whether you see it in body language or in what you hear them say or whether they directly say it and your initial reaction is, I don't know what to do with that so I'll do nothing with it. Do you need God's help so you can discern their needs and then how you can respond. Or third, do you need God's help to develop courage so that when you have a loving motivation and you've discerned the needs of others, you are willing to speak and you are willing sometimes to admonish, to rebuke, to correct, to reprove or sometimes just to instruct, to explain, to sympathise, to reflect, or affirm. Because it's in those moments, often the Holy Spirit just prompts something inside us. Now, say it now. Do you need God's help to rise to that challenge and speak Jesus in that moment? So as I finish, let's ask God, and then I pray that, the Holy Spirit would guide you. Today, choose to speak Jesus, to be an encourager, and to build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have not left us alone. You have given us a comforter, an advocate. May the Holy Spirit be the one that guides us the way we need challenge today. We need your help. Help us to be encouragers that we might build each other up. And may that become a habit that's more than just with our church. May that be a habit that's with our friendships, that's in our workplaces, that's with strangers, that's in the community. Help us to grow, to be encouragers, to speak Jesus, to speak hope, to speak life. Lord, in the minds of each person today who's heard your word, prompt in them to seek you closer, to change because you are growing them to conform more to the image of your son Jesus. Just highlight now in the quiet of their mind, 
where you are speaking hope. Lord, for those who've struggled in the past to be an encourager, to have the motivation that's right, Lord, we confess that to you and ask for your forgiveness. And in the hope that we know of truth of forgiveness, may we be free to serve, to love and to speak Jesus. Father, for the leadership of this church, I also pray that you would work through your Holy Spirit, that they may be growing as encouragers. That would become a positive infection of this community. That they speak and they build others up and encourage each other. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Grant. What great words of encouragement. We're now going to sing our last song, which is 10,000 Reasons. Sing along. Um, remain seated if you like. Uh, it was, um, yeah, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> 10,000 Reasons. <laughs> I'm having a, a senior's moment, I think. Okay. Technical issues, we won't be a moment. The computer's been playing up a bit this morning. Colin very kindly did a, a, a lovely fix this morning. We thought we'd had it. It was playing up and Colin got his magic fingers onto it. Uh, but it looks like it's um, reverted to its um, little gremlin there. There we are. Going to do the doxology, Andrew, because I thought you were having the day off. <laughs> Our doxology today is uh, the blessing, um, and this is our my prayer for you as we you leave this place today, and um, a blessing over everyone. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, and um, drive safely going home. And you've, oh, the cricket's just about to start, but I'm sure by the time you get home, um, we'll have got two wickets, and or if we're batting, 50 runs at least. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the day.